I'm Kunal. I'm a software engineer at Meta. I've been working there for around 12 years at this point. And for the last four, I've been working on tools for ML engineers. I'll be talking about building intermediate logging. And I'll basically cover what I mean by intermediate logging so you get something interesting out of the talk. I'll speed run through all the tricky bits of the implementation for the bulk of this talk and hopefully give you some tricks in case you're implementing your own versions. And at the end, I'll talk about some of the applications I've seen people apply it to at the end. So what do I mean by intermediate logging? Whenever you define a module in PyTorch, there are a couple of interesting values. You can have parameters and buffers that are interesting arguments, or like an internal state for the model. You can have forward arguments to the model uh, that you may care about looking at. There's something the model is returning. And at the same time, when you run gradients, <clears throat> or when you run backward propagation, you kind of want to see all the gradients. These could be the gradients that are the output of the module with respect to the loss. It could be the gradient of the forward argument. It could be the gradient like self.p.grad or anything else. And so those are the interesting values that you may want to look at to understand what the model is doing. Jumping straight into the implementation, PyTorch has three interesting APIs that you may find useful or you may, have, you may be familiar with. One is a forward hook. Uh, with a forward hook, you can instrument pretty much all the arguments passed to the model as well as all the values returned from the module. Um, there is a tensor hook, which you can attach to a tensor and just see any gradients that come from it. There is a backward hook, um, which will help you capture any gradients uh, anytime backward propagation is called. Uh, and if you're doing only pure PyTorch models or you're only using torch.compile, uh, this talk is over. You can use these three APIs, capture all the values, and there is time to attend the LLM talks going on at the same time. If you're not lucky enough to only do pure PyTorch, and you're using FX transforms, dot scripting, torch packaging your model and distributing it, or even just pure pickling your model, you run into issues. Uh, the biggest one is that backward hooks aren't supported in dot script, and this is one of those things that annoys a lot of people. And that's what I'm going to dive into with the rest of this talk. Uh, there are two themes going forward. One is we made this work however we could, uh, irrespective of whatever problems we ran into. The other is that I'm pretty scared of the kind of things we did in production to make it happen. I'll start with abusing hooks. Uh, given that the forward hook API is the only one that is consistently supported across different transforms you can do with PyTorch, uh, that is the one you kind of abuse. And I'll start with the thing that I saw most frequently asked on Stack Overflow. How do you get gradients in a dot scripted model? And the trick here is that you can implement your own C++ autograd function uh, that is supported in thought script. And in our implementation, we basically did a no-op autograd function in the backward pass. You can observe the gradient that's being passed through and log it explicitly. So that gives you some observability into the system. Uh, the forward hook lets you override the output of a module. So you apply this function to the output of the module, and that lets you capture any of the values you care about. Um, like I said, tensor hooks and backward hooks aren't supported, so you just skip them and rely on the forward hook to do everything. Um, now that you're using Todd script and you're supporting it, you run into a lot of constraints for every and every single hook that needs to happen. So the biggest one is that each module has a different set of arguments. Each hook must explicitly accept a tuple that supports those arguments. And the way we worked around this was to dynamically generate hooks. So we would introspect on the module's forward function, look at all the types passed in, generate code, and then use that to instrument and capture all the values from the hooks. Um, you'll also run into weirder things like Torch FX will skip hooks on the outermost module. Uh, in practice, this isn't that bad because I've seen most models tend to have a lot of wrapper modules that you don't care about. Um, you'll also notice that FX gives you a way to make sure that a function is included in the graph, but FX.wrap doesn't work when directly applied to hook. So you apply it to functions inside the hook to capture interesting values. Um, there are other weird constraints you'll run into, like dot script. Only inside a hook can dot script accept a module as an argument, but if you try to call a function in dot script with a module, that'll break. Um, there are also other stranger constraints you may run into, and those are things you basically work around while doing code gen in Python and skip all of these problems. Um, once you have this code generated, you kind of 
you apply this trick that I think all compiler engineers will hate, which is that you kind of you generate code that a compiler can't distinguish between like is this useless code or was this code that the model owner actually wanted to run, and that way you kind of guarantee that the transform will keep the code around. Um, I can see Avik staring at me. Um, so one example is that both FX and JIT tracing would ignore buffers. So if I was only calling our functions with a buffer, they would disappear. And the trick around that was to take forward arguments or output arguments, just stuff them into the function call and force them to be part of the execution graph. You can kind of see like there's an underscore n equal to none hidden there in that function call. And that is how you basically tell the, cheat the compiler and say, hey, I have this important argument. Please don't throw me away. The other thing to force it is that you need to return values from the function sometimes. So you write a lot of functions that look like x equal to f of x to force f to be part of your modules, like the model's graph execution. And that just forces it to stick around permanently. Um, while doing all of this, you'll also notice that there are other tools. All those tools tend to depend on parameters. And if you're modifying the model graph itself, it's much safer to modify buffers instead of parameters. And I found that tends to work reasonably well in practice. Now that you have a lot of generated code that's working reasonably well, and you've hacked around all of these transforms, you run into this problem when you try to distribute the code. For all of Torch package, Torch script, and everything like that to work, you need to kind of make the system think the code exists and is materialized somewhere. The biggest trick here is that you stuff the line cache module in Python. Uh, this is inspired from how Jupyter notebooks themselves work. When you execute a cell in Jupyter, it actually puts the values into line cache and gives it a fake file name, and then it compiles and execs it. So we did the same with the hook code. We put the hook code into line cache, which means Python's inspect would find the code and then be able to use it. Once you have that, uh, Torch package still wants to find a module for all of this code. Just having it available in spec isn't enough. So you explicitly create your own uh, import lib loaders, and that can help make a virtual module appear in the path, and Torch package will materialize the code. Uh, when we had this working, it was very satisfying when I would Torch package and suddenly files would appear magically that showed the hooks created on our behalf. Um, Torch package is source code plus state distributed together. But if you happen to be distributing your model just through pure pickling, you don't get the source code anymore, uh, which is very, very painful if you're dynamically generating code. Uh, when pickle pickles a model, uh, or pickles a module, or it pickles a function, the only thing it is going to write as opcode is the function name. Um, in completely unrelated news, if I base 32 encode something, uh, 31 characters are safe as identifiers, and there's an equal to sign. So if you replace the equal to with an underscore, you can generate something that is a valid Python identifier. So we took the hook code, zipped it, base32 encoded it, and made it the function name. And that way, when it gets pickled, uh, it gets distributed safely. And then when you use get getatter inside the module, you can uh, decode it, unzip it, exec it with all the code we just talked about, and suddenly the hook exists again. Sometimes you also may find scenarios where all of this code that you're adding to hooks itself gets torch packaged. And here the trick is that you can be very careful about where you exec the hooks we just generated. So if you can exec it inside the torch packaged code itself, it will make sure it uses the right set of dependencies and have it materialized properly. Um, along the way as we did this, right, like the only way to say stay, in, uh, stay sane was to have each potential transformation of the model explicitly listed out, add the hooks up front, and then make sure all the transformed code logged the right values. By the time we were done, we had more than 100 tests running every time we changed something. So after that speed run, I'll quickly talk through some of the things I've seen people do over the past six months. People training models that had multiple objectives noticed that some of their gradients were off by orders of magnitude. So one task would learn really fast, and the other task would not really catch up. Uh, so they were able to adjust their model to do that, fix that behavior. Uh, there were some classical examples of dead neurons or saturated neurons in models. Uh, one of my teammates managed to shrink his model by half, doing the fixing, like just using the instrumentation to figure this out and then fixing it. Um, for people building their own transforms, this is also useful because you can see the behavior of the model right before and right after. And it is mapped to the source code, so you can kind of figure out what happened along the way. Um, 
I had really hoped to drop some demo code right at the same time as this so you could apply it, uh, but I couldn't make the times work out properly. But in a few weeks, we should have some demo code that makes this work, puts all of this together end to end, just so you can build off of it to build your own custom tools. Given there are so many strange tricks in there, it's not super generic, but hopefully people can apply it for their own things that they're like, they would like to build. Um, Thank you for attending the talk. Uh, there are lots of interesting LLM talks going on at the same time, so I'm surprised to see everyone here. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to my teammates. Like We've had people who've pushed what they can do with intermediate logging, and people who are also carrying the project forward at Meta right now. And um, I'm not sure if you have a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any right now or after the fact if you want to reach out. Thank you. Um, so the slides are already on the talk page, so you can download them and get them, I think. So, uh, but I'll also try to release the sample code. So uh, there are weirder things. That, like when you put it together, it gets a little more awkward. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you.